Hello everyone, Resonance here, and today I'll be giving you all my commentary on Game 2 out of 5 games played between the two teams, Tyrant Legends and NC Friends in Arma. These matches are part of the group stages of the War is Coming tournament, which is by far the largest tournament in Age of Empires 2 history, boasting a massive prize pool of 120,000 US dollars. Now, of course, War is Coming is being played on the Voobly Gaming Client, and you can find more information as well as links to download the replays from AOC Zone in the video description below. If you missed Game 1, then you can also check the video description quickly for a link to watch that first, as well as links to other games that I have casted. In a moment, I am going to turn back on the overlay, which will spoil the results of Game 1, so make sure you watch that first. And as you're probably aware, your feedback is appreciated, so feel free to leave me a comment and tell me if this is the type of thing you'd like to see me do more of in the future. Alright, without further ado, let's jump straight into Game 2, which will be played on the custom map called Ancient Lake. Before I describe the map though, I am going to take a moment to introduce each of the players and their respective teams. Alright, so... In the right corner of the map, we have Cab playing as the Blue Mongols, and just below him, we have Jordan23 playing as the Orange Vikings. Towards the bottom of the map, we have the Viper playing as the Green Huns, and just above him, we have Doubt playing as the Teal Japanese. Now, I feel like the Tyrant team itself needs no introduction, since if you've watched any competitive AoE2 recently, you've probably recognized most of the players, and... Since they f have formed their own team, they have actually never lost a tournament. However, their opponents, NC and friends in Arma, are no slackers either, boasting an entirely German roster and a very skilled list of individual players, NC and friends in Arma may have the potential to take a game off Tyrant Legends if they coordinate effectively. Towards the top left corner of the map, we have Sniper1 playing as the Grey Japanese, and to his right we have Skittle playing as the Yellow Huns. Up near the top corner of the map, we have Andorin playing as the Purple Mongols, and just below him, we have Nilpfert playing as the Red Vikings. Now, Nilpfert, Skittle, and Arma, uh, who has actually been subbed out this game in exchange for Sniper 1, actually placed 6th in the Tribal Wars tournament, which is quite impressive. I feel like... Since this is a water map, this is definitely going to be the most one-sided game in the series, but it's also the game in which I feel like NC has the highest chance of taking a game off Tyrant, just because water maps by nature can be, uh, you know, a little snowball-y. Which brings me to the map itself, uh, Ancient Lake. You'll notice that this is, well, like I mentioned, it's obviously a water map, you know, in which the very, very long lake divides the two teams. Since there is no land passage across the lake, and the lake itself is teeming with valuable fish. Both teams will have to compete heavily, heavily for control of the water. That is what these matches always boil down to on water maps, control of the sea. Now the reason that taking control of the water is so important is that, well for one, when you build a dock, which we're going to see uh, Doubt build one right now, I do believe, uh, you get to build a bunch of fishing ships, and it's basically like having another town center in the Dark Age that's creating villagers. And, not only are they creating villagers, but they also happen to be producing very efficient villagers, as fishing ships do gather quite nicely from uh, deep and uh, middle sea fish, like the, uh, the fish Dorado. I don't know if there's actually any, any marlin on this map, but either way, the fish is a very, very valuable resource that the players will have to compete for, and it does give them a massive edge. Not only do you get a you know, continuous, ridiculous source of food, like, you're paying like 75 wood per fishing ship, and you're getting a, an amazing return on that value through all this food that's right here. Uh, you know, that's wood that you basically save in the long run that you don't have to make farms with. Not only do you get all that stuff, but you also get complete control of the map, and since there's no land passage between the two teams, the players that have the water basically get to play on the offensive the entire game, and you can't really win and actually take anybody out of the game without control of the water. Now, uh, is Cab gonna make it with this boar lure? Uh, he's gonna lose the scout, but I mean that's okay because he is gonna, he's going to, you know, get the boar uh, underneath his TC. If you're wondering why the players are doing this, because I think that that's a reasonable question, uh, you know, why, why is Tyrant using their scouts to lure their boars rather than their villagers? Because if we look at uh, NC, they're actually using their villagers to lure the boar, which is standard, right? 
you know, you'll never see the top players, you know, just harvesting the boar from where it is or building a mill over there because it's a huge waste of wood and it's very inefficient having your villagers walk so far. You'll usually see them shoot the boar twice with the villager, run it under the TC like such, and then harvest it from there. It's all about being efficient in these high-level Age of Empires 2 games. Now, Tyrant is using their scout here uh, instead of their villagers for a couple of reasons. For one, it means that they get to have a villager during this entire time, you know, gathering from a resource, so it's very, very nice uh, that they get to, you know, save just a little bit of extra resources there by having their scout do it instead. Now, normally your scout is a lot more important than it is in this map, but remember, you know, the teams, there's no land passage, so it's not like they can use their scout to actually see what the enemy team is up to. So they might as well use it in this case to lure the boar. And it's this type of thing that gives them just a tiny, tiny edge over their opponents here. And I would not be surprised if they got to the feudal age just like maybe 10, 15 seconds sooner. One thing that I like to see here uh, is that we can see that the Viper, when he built this dock with his villager, he had his fisherman, uh, he had the builder here, become like a fisherman, take 10 food from the shorefish, and then walk back to the base. Again, very efficient. You're going to be walking this distance anyway. You might as well harvest a, just a teeny bit of resources first and then go do that. And, wow, it actually looks like looks like Jordan is like basically ready to go up to the feudal age once these uh, hunters drop off the food. And, oh my, that's terrifying. That is terrifying. And another thing that I do want to bring up is that you know, both teams have the Vikings, which is like a very, very standard sieve that you'll see on water since their team boat is makes docks cheaper for everybody and their war boats are just you know, also incredibly cheap to create as well. They're very, very strong. And as we can see, Jordan here already advancing to the next stage. What did he do? Took all of his villagers off food, all of them. And now he's transitioning everything into wood. He's going to build another lumber camp, I'm assuming, like right here. And then he's going to put like three, uh, three villagers on gold, I'm assuming which is usually the standard amount that you'll see players do, as that is just enough gold income to sustain galley production from their docks. Uh, and then they're going to add maybe a few more gold miners later, and he's going to also add another dock here. And if we look at the rest of his team, if we look at the Viper, he is also already up. You know, that is a ridiculous, uh, ridiculous feudal age. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, Cab's feudal age time is absolutely ridiculous, and Doran as well, very, very quick, but they are the Mongols, so they are able to do that with their faster, faster hunting bonus, and remember, it's all about water control on these maps, all about water control, so getting to the feudal age faster is extremely, extremely critical. If you get to the feudal age maybe like a minute quicker, you get to get at a couple galleys before your opponent does, and there's really not too much they can do about that. Matches do spiral out of control, but... I mentioned that NC has the highest chance, I think, to win this game, even though I think this will be the most one-sided one in the series, either way, because if they manage to get a small edge on the water, then I think they can hold that and maybe just spiral out of control against, uh, against Tyrant. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, it looks like this will not be the case for them, as it looks like Tyrant is entirely up to the Feudal Age now, and, oh, let's see, how's Sniper doing right now? Sniper is not even up to the Feudal Age, and we've got some... Uh oh yeah, we got a bunch of we've got a bunch of galleys coming out here from Doubt right now, and he's gonna Doubt is gonna have two galleys out before Sniper even starts production of one, which is really, really, really bad. Okay, uh, uh, Cab over here as well, since he got to the uh, feudal age really, really soon, like way before uh, Nilpferk did. That's because he was Mongols, right? Uh, he's going to get the first few shots on these fishing ships, but. Uh, he is kind of surrounded by a lot of docks, so he has to be really careful here, as if he does lose this one galley to Nilferts, uh galleys, which will be coming out really soon, that could also snowball that side. And yeah, Doubt here has these two galleys out, no response here from Sniper, this is absolutely awful, this is how you lose on water maps as you beat. I mean, I think that there was like a minute, I think he was like a minute behind Doubt, and like maybe like two minutes behind the Mongols guys, that's not, that is, that is not good. Uh, these are both the Japanese, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a Japanese versus Japanese mirror match here, so... Tyrant just overall got to the uh, Feudal Age much, much quicker, and I think that's a result of them using their scout to lure the boar. Definitely helps a lot here. <laughs> Looks like uh, we've caught NC doing something really cheeky as they've taken all four of their scouts, which I mentioned, not too useful, because you can't, you can't actually scout the enemy team. Or can you? Because if you take a transport ship like so, and... You know, this is kind of a risk for Mandoran, because it costs a little bit of wood, but he's going to land a bunch of their scouts and... They're going to just be a massive, massive nuisance to Cab here. And I think this is an insanely smart play. This is really, really well done on NC's part. Because what this is going to do, I think, is it's going to do just enough damage to Cab's economy, make his villagers run away. They already got one. All these villagers are idle. It's going to cripple his galley rush, and it might actually just give Nilpfer and Andorran just enough space 
to completely dominate their side. And, and they need this. They absolutely need to do this. So I think this is an amazing decision on their part. They have to do this because Sniper and Skittle, I do not foresee them winning this side at all. I don't think they can. I think the Doubt got to Feudal Age just like a minute sooner, the Viper as well, both up a minute before Sniper was, and like 30 seconds before Skittle, that's going to make a huge difference. This villager here is going to be really cheeky, he's going to try and sneak it around somewhere <laughs> to go build some stuff, but, you know, Jordan obviously saw this with his scout, and he's just going to be a nuisance running around in circles. This villager, he's going to want to try and build some, you know, hidden stables or something like that, do some heavy raiding perhaps with it, but, you know, I really doubt the Tyrant is going to let them here, and we've got a huge galley fight going on. Right now, uh, what I see is that I've got some really good micro from Tyrant right now as, uh, you know, Doubt is pulling back his galleys which are being focused fired by NC. He's pulling them back and the Viper gets all these free shots because these galleys have to chase Doubt's galleys and they're not shooting at anything. Whereas the Viper is shooting at them the entire time. They're going to take another galley for free as the fight continues on this side and... Huh. This side looks pretty close right now, but I do see that uh, Jordan doesn't have that many galleys right now, and I think a lot of this is in part because they were just distracted uh, by all these shenanigans over here, and I do believe the villager, yes, the villager is dead. He had a good run, he had a good run, but it looks like he was end up killed by a scout, which is exactly what I'd expect. Since, uh, since Tyrant saw that transport ship land, I don't think it would have been a huge surprise, but I think that was really smart, because if you look at Cab's score, I mean, that kind of crippled him. You could argue that it crippled the rest of them, and that if Andorin, you know, built something else, like a galley instead of the uh, transport ship, it would have helped a lot, but I think that was really wise, because they were already behind, like, from the get-go, they were behind. They had to take a risk. You always have to when you're behind, and we can see this risk paying off as they're actually managing to hold this side against Tyrant. Tyrant, a clan who has been, they have never lost a tournament uh, since Tyrant Legends has been created, which is just absolutely fantastic. And we look at this, uh, we're going to see the split formation here from Cab as he's going to try and juke these arrows, but it's not going to be enough. They're going to get cleaned up here as we see some great focus fire here from NC. Going to take a lot of galleys for free and hold this side, and if we look a little to the left, it is completely hopeless. <laughs> it's completely hopeless as Sniper, he's seen better days, guys. Uh, th this is all we've got from Skittle here. He's got about mm, a couple galleys. I do see a transport ship, though, huh? Skittle up to no good, again. Ooh, he's got three villagers in that transport ship. I like this, I like this. And we're going to see some solid snake action while we see more galley action over here, which is really heavily favoring NC. Something that concerns me is more that, uh, you know, since this side is such a wash for tyrants, I feel like the Viper can just freely leave this side to doubt and just assist uh, NC on uh, the other side and just make it like a 3v2. And I really don't really don't think they can win uh, win that in that case, but this transport ship is actually going to make it as Skittle, you know, sneaking around really carefully. Uh, you know, Viper, a very attentive player. <laughs> He's going to notice this, of course, but I don't think he can stop it, but oh my god, unit pathing. Right? <laughs> the transport ship getting stuck on the enemy fishing ships as though they are covered in glue, but oh, is this transport ship going to land? Jordan's got to send these galleys in. Skittle walking the wrong way. He should probably just go straight down here and... Uh, oh! Transport ship down with that three of Skittles villagers, 125 wood, and all of their dreams in one boat sunk straight to the bottom of the ocean. That is really bad. But the dream is still alive for NC as we do see that, uh, you know, Nilfert and Andorin putting in insane work here with just absolutely ridiculous micro. You'll see a lot of tricks that the players will do here as they'll move parallel to their opponent's galley shots to try and dodge and they'll try and focus fire down individual galleys, pull back injured ones that your opponents are focus firing down, and the players will just really make the absolute best of, you know, just having an army of only one type of unit, just such great, great micro from NC that they're actually, I mean, you see, we see the Viper coming in here like I mentioned, but is that even going to be enough? I mean, Cab has like no galleys whatsoever, and I, it looks like NC has almost the same amount of galleys as, uh, as Tyrant does over here. They might actually be able to they might be able to hold this on against all odds, as Doubt is just having his way with Sniper right now. He's like, oh yes, please, just spawn those free galleys. But Sniper here being really smart, and he's taking the galleys that come out of his docks, however few there may be, and he's going to try and regroup with the, uh, with the rest of his teammates and see what he can do off this. One thing that's good is that Skittle has realized that the situation is completely grim, and when you're behind, guys, you have to take risks. You do, whether they pay off or not. And he's going to try and get to the Castle Age before everybody else. He has just basically neglected galley production entirely for some time because he knows they're just going to die as they come out of these 
uh, as these docks, and he's just gonna try and get to the Castellade first, but here's a problem I'm thinking of. I bet the Tyrants is gonna get to the Castellade first. If we look at the Viper here, he is, of course, one step ahead of his opponents most of the time, and he is actually really close to the Castellade, and if we look at the scores, I would not be surprised if Doubt is, yeah, Doubt is already clicked up too. If we look at Jordan. Jordan already advancing, oh my god and Cab as well. So every single member of Tyrant is advancing to the Castle Age right now, and I think they're all going to get there before uh, before NC does, because I believe Skittle is the only one advancing right now, as I haven't seen anyone else's scores uh, drop too much, although Andorin might be... Okay, Andorin just clicked up too, so that's fine. Oh, this game's looking grim! <laughs> this game's looking grim for them, but they're still holding on against all odds on this side. This is basically 2v3, but... We see a little bit of, I think, a little bit of miscommunication here as these uh, galleys caught out of position. Uh, Nilfert is actually going to be uh, basically focused down here. And, I don't know, Andorin's galley's just a little bit out of position, just trying to attack the Viper. And, you know, Nilfert's just going to lose his entire army here for free, basically. And, uh-oh, that's looking, uh, that's looking not so good for them. But still, still, despite that, you know, micro blunder right there, they're still in this. And NC showing some, you know, shocking signs of life. If that transport ship landed, that could have been big. The first one, I think, was one of the most creative and cool things I've seen in a uh, Galley Rush-style game. Like, it's absolutely, absolutely brilliant, and it, it really did pay off. The second transport ship, not so much, but the first one, definitely. The Viper here got up to the Castle Age. Everybody on Tyrant up to the Castle Age first. Gonna get that Bodkin Arrow upgrade. Jordan almost there, and we see more cheeky transport ship play as Cab over here. Uh, he's headed up to here with these transport ships as... Look at the damage this scout has done to the blacksmith. It's hilarious. I feel like he's not getting any value out of this scout, though, and you might want to use it for something else. Anyway, Cab here landing with a villager in a transport ship. Going to build a couple stables, uh, which, uh, you know, Nilpfert has just noticed right now for sure, but I don't think he saw that land yet. He did not see that land. That's usually why you'll see uh, players put their houses along the coastline to try and scout for that. Knights are going to come out, and Andorin's going to call GG as soon as they see the knights in Nilpfert's base, which I think is fair. Uh, but wait, <laughs> Skittle has tried yet again to do a landing, oh my god, NC, not quite, <laughs> Andorin realizes that he sees the knights in Nilfair's base and he's just like, alright guys, it's over, and then he's like, wait a minute, Skittle has landed guys, never mind, uh, sorry, we, we play five more minutes, <laughs> NC with a great sense of humor, they're like, no, 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 no. Just, just five more minutes guys, uh, has the Viper seen these things being built, I'm sure he has, right, oh, I'm sure Doubt has seen this, right? Oh! Well, I know the transport ship is dead, but I don't think they know that Skittle has such a massive army there. It looks like in this time... Unfortunately, Nilpferd and Andorin are going to be cleaned up on the water because they lack the War Galley upgrade and the Bodkin Arrow, which they're getting just now. Too little, too late. As the Viper, you know, gets to join in freely here since the left side of the map just completely fell apart. Yeah, there's really no way that 2v3 they could hold that out for that long, even though, you know, NC has proven that they have insane godlike micro, and they were doing it for a really long time, which is absolutely impressive. Looks like Tyrant has noticed that, uh, there's an intruder in the base, Red Spy in the base, and we've got the, uh, the Knights coming out with a plus two defense upgrade and bloodlines, so Skittle really committing to this. Gonna plop out some battering rams, and I hope Doubt is prepared. I do believe that Doubt is on the, you know, like, four TCs or something. He's gonna put down some barracks. Maybe try to get out some pikemen, because he's the Japanese, so they do attack a little bit faster. Water being cleaned up over here as uh, Nilpfer, not really, can't, not too much he can do here. He did try and wall off his lumber camp to try and protect it against those knights, and, you know, while that was a good plan in retrospect, eh, it didn't work out so well, because Cap here is going to throw in a mangonel, kill all these guys, the Viper is going to bring in some ships to go just wipe them out. The thing here is that, alright, we've got, we've got Skittle coming in with guys, uh, the thing here is that I feel like Cab's landing is a lot more effective than Skittle's because, you know, Andorin doesn't really have... Last time I checked, yeah, I don't think Andorin has a barracks at all. You know, he doesn't even have a barracks. Nope, no barracks. Whereas Doubt has a much bigger economy than Andorin. Andorin only on three TCs. I mean, he's going to put up a fourth. Only on three TCs. Doubt on four. Doubt has, like, three barracks. He's going to build a fourth one. You can get out a couple pikemen. Sure, he's got no upgrades, and these knights are really buff. They lift. Uh, he's probably gonna do a lot of damage to Doubt, but here's the problem. The Viper has 4,000 score, he is your next door neighbor, and he's angry. He's gonna make, he's just gonna, he can make knights from each of these stables, and if we check his stables, uh, oh yeah, he was making knights, so. 
I don't think that this would have really killed Doubt, although it was definitely a, a well-thought-out last-ditch desperation effort, but, you know, Cab's Landing, a lot more effective here because Andorin has no answer to this, and if you're in the Feudal Age, it's really difficult to deal with these knights. You just can't make enough spearmen to really deal with them. Uh, knights, just insanely, insanely powerful units, and... Yeah, no fair, not, not really too much he could do without the help of his pocket player, and Andorin here just did not even have a barracks, uh, yeah. Really, the game fell apart, I think, as early as 10 minutes in the game, uh, due to uh, snipers, you know, uh, a little slower feudal age time than his opponents, and Skittle being about 30 seconds behind as well, just really snowballed this game. The left-hand side of the map for NC just completely fell apart. And while the right-hand side of the map with uh, Nilp Ferret and Andorin managed to hold 2v3 for like 10 minutes, it was ridiculous. They were holding like 2v3 for, well, maybe not 10 minutes, but close to that, you know, they were holding that for quite some time. Doing a lot of damage, uh, NC here tried to do really cheeky transport ship play, put all four of their scouts to good use, and, you know, that one on the side is showing promising signs of life. While things definitely didn't work out as they planned it to be, um, I think that they have the potential. They have the potential to uh, maybe win a game here, maybe. You know, Tyrant, of course, has absolutely ridiculous you know, coordination and just individual player skill, but NC here showing that they have some tricks up their sleeve, and you know one of their tricks definitely worked, some of them did. Maybe we'll see some more interesting strategies from them next time to try and shake up Tyrant just a little bit, take them out of their comfort zone, show them something that they weren't prepared for, and maybe in this case the underdog can win, because obviously Tyrant Legends is favorite to win here. We'll see, we'll see. I thought this was a great match, even though it wasn't, you know, extremely close, because we got to see some very, very creative plays from NC, and we also got to see some absolutely exceptional, impeccable micro from both sides, which I always love to watch. You know, water maps not, might not be the most exciting, because everybody just goes galleys, and all you see is a galley rush. It's like, water map strategy boils down to, do I grush, or do I grush? But I still think it's really fun to watch the high-level players do this type of galley rush because we get to see the power of just near-flawless micro. Near-flawless micro, and, and really just how much it can do. Like, these guys were holding 2v3, so consider me very much impressed. What a good game indeed. What a good game indeed. Water map's very snowball-y. I think if you just fall a little bit behind uh, in terms of, like, Feudal Age timings, I mean, that could be it. All right, well, let's go, let's go check out the achievements, shall we? Here's the Tyrant victory theme. Wow, look at that score, though. The Viper with 4,000 score. He's not, he's not fucking around, guys. The score difference between the two teams is absolutely ridiculous. Seriously, this is absurd. I mean, the Viper has, like, over double uh, the lowest score on NC. And really, NC didn't have... <laughs> I mean, NC has everybody on their team is a lower score than uh, Tyrant's lowest score, and, and and Cab had you know a pretty tough game as he did get landed by those four scouts, and he had to deal with that one villager, and you know, all of that you know, meant that he had the the smallest, largest army in the game. But you know, Cab coming back for revenge, landing with his own uh, with his own villagers, going for knights, and that basically just secured the game right there. Cab's decision to land and make knights basically secured it. I, I, there are ways to come back when you lose the water, like you can build a defensive castle along the coastline. But it's, it's really tricky, and clearly NC did not want to try and drag this game out. They weren't really confident that they could take on, uh, take on Tyrant if the game went to the super late game. They didn't think that they could really claim the water back. And I don't blame them, as it can be extremely difficult. Especially since, even if they could have reclaimed the water, Cat had already landed, and they had no response to his knight. So things were looking grim, and... And right here, I would say this is where the game was lost. We saw that last game... Oh, did I never turn on the score overlay? Awkward. Said it was gonna. I'll, I'll update it right now. Anyway. So we see right here that uh, last game was won basically because Skittles, map... Well, he had no gold. That was basically what, what clinched that one, is there was just really uh, no gold from them, and the Viper was just booming completely untouched. Uh, Somehow, I don't know, last game the uh, Tyrant managed to, like, 3v4 it, even. Like, the Viper didn't really need to do anything towards the very end. Uh, and, you know, the gold gold was the real clincher there, though. Definitely, Skittle had no gold, so he just got completely swarmed by doubt. In this game, it's going to be maybe something that's uh, a little inefficient with the build order. I'm not quite sure, but yeah, either way, we look at this uh, doubt and Sniper, the same civilization, doubt over a minute faster to the Feudal Age, and, you know, the Viper... 
you know, very, very quick to the feudal age as well. Skill just a teeny bit behind, and that type of thing allowed them to get some galleys out just a teeny bit sooner and really just snowball the game. Seeing Tyrant lure the boar with their scouts was really brilliant, uh, because I think it gave them just a teeny bit of an edge. I'm pretty sure that was the extra, like, 20 seconds difference, uh, honestly, uh, between the, the Viper and Skittle. Also seeing them, you know, have their uh, villager who built a dock harvest uh, from some of the shore fish and then walk back to the town center, you'll see a lot of little nuances, little tricks that the top players will do to just be a little bit more efficient and give them a tiny, tiny little edge. And that's what will win you the game on water maps 9 out of 10 times. Those are some those are some pretty big economies from Tyrant over here. So yeah, what a good game. GG, GG, well played. Alright guys, so I hope you all enjoyed watching this video. And if you did, you know, please, uh, please do leave me a like rating as it does help me out a lot. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, I do have plenty of other Age of Empires 2 videos on my YouTube channel, as well as videos for other games. So, if you like this one, you'll probably like those as well. As always, guys, I really do appreciate the support. You know, please do uh, feel free to leave me a comment and whatnot. Tell me if this is the type of thing you'd like me to do more of in the future. And I really look forward to bringing you guys the rest of the games in these series. Now, someone has mentioned to me uh, in my uh, video comments that uh, Zero Empires has already casted this game. Correct me if I'm wrong, I might be wrong, but I thought uh, at least his plan was to cast every single game in War is Coming, so I feel like it's impossible for me to not overlap with him if I do War is Coming commentaries. Really what I did is I went to AOC Zone and I picked the most recent game and I commented, I, I did my commentary on it like two hours after it was uploaded uh, to AOC Zone, so I wanted to pick one that you guys haven't seen yet if you've watched Zero Empires and stuff, but I mean I guess I picked one that you've already seen him do. <laughs> I tried! <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's a way, uh, I don't know if the, the Zero Empires isn't commenting on uh, specific games, I don't know. Because I understand that some people don't want to watch the same game uh, that uh, you've already seen him commentate. But, you know, not uh, we don't share 100% of the same viewer base, so I, I'm going to finish the series anyway, of course. And hopefully the future series that I do cast will be you know, a little bit more evenly matched than this. Although, like I mentioned, NC showing some surprising signs of life. I, I've been enjoying this series, even, even if Tyrant is clearly favored to win. Hopefully future games that I cast will be a, a little less, uh, a little less clear cut, a little less clear cut, and, you know, I'll probably be doing some non-War Is Coming stuff as well, uh, since, you know, Zero Empires is already, you know, just montaging out War Is Coming content like, like a machine gun, right, like a video every five seconds. I might just do some non-War uh, Is Coming stuff as well, we'll see. Let me know what you think, uh, and yeah, you know, your feedback is, of course, appreciated here, yeah. Uh, I've got to have a bunch of, you know, more information on the tournament and whatnot, as well as links to watch the other stuff uh, in the video description below. Of course, besides the matches that I commentate myself, you know, we got the Voobly official channel, which has, you know, their own commentaries on that, if you're into that type of thing. And, you know, Zero Empires has already casted, you know, 99% of the matches in this tournament so far, so you can also give him a look. Yep. Got a bunch of AOE2 stuff coming, uh, of course, and I've said this before, but I feel the need to you know, end the video uh, by emphasizing that. You know, any, any replay commentaries that I do, they're just extra content that I hope you guys enjoy. I'm not replacing the weekly live stream with this, so don't worry, guys. And uh, if you're wondering, my 3DS capture card has not actually shipped yet, but uh, they say it's coming soon, so soon, TM. All right, thank you guys so much for the support, as always. I'll see you all in Game 3. It's going to be fun. I look forward to seeing what NC brings next game, because they've clearly shown us they've got some tricks up their sleeve. And perhaps those will be the tricks that they need to come out on top. Who knows? GG well played. GG well played.